in the same place. And yeah, I think that's about it. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sarah so she can introduce Andrew. A very dramatic move for a very short introduction. This is uh, Dr. Andrew Hope. I've had the pleasure of working with him for several years. So he's a good friend and colleague, and he's gonna talk about some of his research that he's been doing for longer than we'll admit um, on small mammals. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks for the invitation. It's been great to talk to folks uh, all afternoon today. So thanks very much for spending the time with me. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a general overview of the research that goes on in my lab. I predominantly am a, am a mammalian biologist and an evolutionary biologist, uh, but I am also interested in biodiversity conservation and one health increasingly. And this concept of one health is, is not new, although it's kind of picking up steam in the present time, I've kind of been working with mammals and their pathogens uh, since the last outbreak of hantavirus in the Southwest since in the late 1990s. Uh, so, so I've been in this arena, but not really focusing so much on it. I thought I'd start by just uh, describing what we mean by One Health. Uh, the World Health Organization's uh, definition is an integrated unifying approach to balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and the environment. And so this is about um, human well-being relying on intact biodiversity and functional ecosystems. And unfortunately, there's some lingering challenges to this. Uh, the biggest one is that the majority of funding that goes towards One Health is from the biomedical research side and slightly less from uh, the veterinary medicine side and very, very little focus coming from the biodiversity or the ecosystem science side. And so that's what I'm basically trying to push. And so the primary challenge here is just, again, building collaborative, integrative research to address One Health from all three and additional angles. So this is just a really brief outline of my talk today. Uh, there's four different parts just to kind of keep you uh, knowing where we're at in the broader scheme of thing. And I'll come back to this slide. But basically, I'm going to just start with an introduction to my lab's research and then uh, talk a little bit about what I consider to be the inherent uh, values of museum specimen resources and then talk a little bit more about evolutionary ecology and then pull it back around to One Health towards the end of the talk. Okay, so um, the folks in my lab uh, work with mammals, but also with all of the biodiversity that's associated with those mammals. We kind of consider each individual mammal as a habitat upon which and within which um, uh, is a plethora of other species that are associated with that mammal. Um, so for instance, uh, I work with shrews, rodents, and bats, small mammals predominantly, um, but I also work with their ectoparasites. And so we have fleas and ticks, which of course are vectors for different pathogens. We have endoparasites such as cestodes or nematodes, um, which are variably co-evolved or co-diversified. And then we have associated pathogens or pathogenic uh, elements of the two that I've talked about. And so folks in my lab are you know, out in the field a lot of the time where we go out in the summer times, collect specimens and then break them down into their constituent parts. And so all of my students, many of whom are undergraduates as well as graduate students, learn this process of specimen curation um, from the field to eventually uh, permanent archive in museums, and then also how to use those specimens for science. Uh, the predominant uh, data, so basically once we have the specimens, uh, then we take them to the lab and we digest the tissues, extract DNA, and then basically sequence various different parts of the genome and then translate or interpret those genetic sequences uh, depending on what the particular question is. And so we're moving on from simple amplicon sequencing such as mitochondrial sequencing um, to more like genomic sequencing. And the major data source that I use is a reduced representation genomic sequencing, particular, particularly double digest restriction site associated DNA sequencing methods. Um, and then we also use ecological niche models. Uh, so this is a picture of my lab group from a good number of years ago. I've got graduate students who have all passed on to their next major stage in their higher education at really great institutions. And then a bunch of undergraduates, these three ladies were working in my lab for over three years each. And so gained some really valuable experiences there. 
okay, I would consider myself as an evolutionary ecologist, but of course that's a really broad umbrella. Um, and lots of evolutionary ecologists wouldn't necessarily associate much with the kinds of research that I do, but I think it would be safe to say that all of us evolutionary ecologists um, to varying degrees are interested in two major things. One, to explain the ecology of organisms in the context of their evolutionary history, or conversely, to understand how evolution occurs in response to ecological changes or processes of change, or variably both of these different things. And so the research in my lab is dealing with uh, both fundamental research questions as well as applied research activities. Uh, I'm interested in understanding how natural selection occurs or um, conversely, whether evolution that's going on is much more neutral in its nature, such as genetic drift. Um, and so this gets at variably functional evolutionary questions. I'm interested in this concept of um, parallel evolution, whether or not it's multiple co-distributed species occurring or evolving in the same manner, manner across space and through time, or whether it's uh, multiple species that are obligately associated with each other, um, co-diversifying in a neutral manner um, just because of those associations, or whether it's true co-evolution where there's a functional aspect of this um, kind of uh, Red Queen process, for instance. Um, and then I'm also interested in uh, species limits and understanding uh, what the intraspecific diversity within species is and uh, focusing on what the most important unit of analysis is, depending on what the question is. And so this really breaks into the applied side of my research, um, looking at conservation of biodiversity. Are we interested in conserving whole species or is there a particular regional lineage or subpopulation that's more important? Uh, increasingly, I'm interested in wildlife diseases. At the moment, I'm working with deer and chronic wasting disease, for instance, and from genetic perspective, looking at uh, relative susceptibility to that. Um, and then of course, uh, human health and zoonotic pathogens. These uh, zoonotic diseases mostly come from mammals. And so building up progressive surveillance of wildlife uh, towards human well being. So I'm going to give you kind of a vignette from the research of one of my graduate students, which kind of outlines all of these different aspects of evolutionary ecology. Um, this is the master's thesis of my first graduate student to graduate, Ben Weens here, who moved on to KU now to do his PhD associated with the Biodiversity Institute. Um, so this, his research was focused on St. Paul Island. This is a tiny little island up in the Bering Sea, which is located right here in between Alaska and Siberia. And this tiny little island is less than 100 square kilometers. It's a tiny little piece of land. Um, the two of us went up there in 2018 and 2019 for a week each to actually teach at the local school system um, through a STEM educational event. Um, the island is home to the Anangan people. This, this is an Aleut tribe associated with the Aleutian archipelago predominantly. Um, and basically scientists who work up in this region went to the island for a week each year to basically teach all the classes and all the age groups. It was a blast. Um, and we recruited some of those students from you know, kindergarten up to come out and help us set pitfall traps and to trap for what is essentially the only native mammal occurring on that island, which is this tiny little mammal here, Sorex privlofensis. Um, this is an isolated species that occurs nowhere else on the globe, but it has a really interesting history. So I wanna walk you through this. Um, back during the last glacial phase, when sea levels were lowered because ice was built up over land masses, um, this whole area was essentially a land bridge or the Bering Isthmus between the Northern continents. And shrews would have been hypothetically evenly, more or less evenly distributed through this huge area. Then as globes war the globe warmed, sea levels rose and subsequent fragmentation basically fragmented this entire study region. And subsequently after that, all of the shrews basically diverged from one another in isolation. So this is a nice system to understand the processes of fragmentation on an evolutionary scale. And what he found was not only that this uh, taxon isolated on this tiny little island was uh, highly divergent from all of the other shrews 
um, on the other islands in the mainland area, but it also pretty much bled all of its genomic diversity. It had genomically flatlined out of the thousands of genetic loci that we used from the um, genomic subsampling, there was virtually no variability across a really robust sample size. Um, and so it was both divergent and didn't have any genomic diversity. And that has a lot of implications for conservation in a really rapidly changing world if you don't have any adaptive capacity, for instance. It's also interesting from a functional perspective because how can a species persist for so long on such a tiny little place with no genetic diversity whatsoever. So it's an interesting system. But we went a little bit further than that, and we started looking at the parasites inside these things. If you go to a shrew on mainland Alaska, they'll quite easily carry within them 12 to 15 different kinds of tapeworms, different species of tapeworms within an individual shrew, not just within a species. Um, so really, really high endoparasitic diversity. Well, as well as bleeding the genomic diversity of this shrew, um, it only held a single species of tapeworm, um, and all of them had it, but none of them had any other species. And we can look at the co-diversification of these by building phylogenies, and if you look at the shape of the tapeworm phylogeny, um, not only do we see that this worm in this shrew is distinct, but the tree for the worms kind of matches the tree for the hosts. And so we can say that this species is relatively co-diverged. Um, but what, what happens when you lose the rest of your parasite diversity is you kind of open up the doors to other kinds of associations. And so we found that a lot of these shrews were actually harboring a new parasite, which is a trematode, which is normally associated with birds. In fact, all of the other trematodes in this genus, Maritrema, are associated with birds as, as the definitive host. And so what we're seeing here is a host switch um, and along with that, a change in all of the different steps in the complex life cycle of this parasite. And so these kinds of changes um, due to massive, basically global scale changes have implications for changing relationships between obligately associated biodiversity. So kind of a cool project overall, and we're still working up there. I wanna talk a little bit about museum specimens because all of my research relies on having materials uh, to understand biodiversity. Most of my research is associated with conservation of biodiversity, but to do that, you have to have the specimens in hand um, in order to have uh, knowledge of, of the species themselves. And so what we do is we go out to the field and we set traps, um, we pick up all the specimens in the morning. This is a huge catch from down here in Southern Texas. Uh, one day, about 90 animals out of 150 traps. It was insane. Um, but then we process those animals fully in the field setting so that we preserve them in the freshest manner as quickly as possible. So we don't refreeze them or anything. We break them down into their constituent parts. We take detailed data. The tissues come out of the animal and are cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen in the field. The parasites are preserved in ethanol in the field. So nothing from these specimens is wasted um, and everything is preserved for the global community to use. These aren't part of my lab. These are part of global science and global potential. So um, I kind of shifted my focus more from the higher latitudes to more of the Great Plains here. And in recent years, since I've been in Kansas State, we've sampled all through this region here. And I'll kind of get through the talk to why this is kind of important from a perspective of asking and answering scientific questions. Uh, all of these folks, just out of interest, are undergrads and graduate students. Every single one of them is now on to the next stage of their higher education. All but one of them is now associated with a graduate program that's associated with a world-class museum's museum collection. And so these kinds of uh, viewpoints of the values of collections definitely can be passed on um, to the next generation. That's one of my primary goals. Um, so I've been working in museum collections and with curation of museum specimens for over 25 years at this point. And through those experiences, myself and a whole slew of different colleagues from multiple different disciplines have really kind of helped to develop the different methodologies for making sure that um, wildlife is broken down into all of its parts and, and preserved in such ways um, to maximize the scientific potential into the future. So it's not just in order to answer the questions that we're asking right now, 
but to preserve those so that the scientists 100 years from now are asking questions we don't know about, they can go back and use the same kinds of samples. Um, so this is kind of really important. And these standardized methods, which have now been published, are being used on a global scale, certainly with uh, mammalian wildlife. So for instance, um, we take a mammal specimen such as this cool little shrew here, which is about this big. Um, this is Sorex hoyi. Um, and then we break it down into its constituent parts. And as well as getting the traditional study skins and skeletons, which you often see in scientific museum specimens, um, we also get the cryopreserved tissues and fluid preserved parasites, which we can use for disease testing or for genomic analyses or you name it, isotopic analyses. Increasingly, we're using modern methods such as meta barcoding to understand, for instance, all of the parasite diversity that's in the guts of a shrew that was pickled in ethanol 50 years ago, and then compare that with parasite diversity in that same species from the same location now. Uh, increasingly, we're interested in evolution occurring across ecological timescales, tying ecology and evolution together. So for instance, looking at the evolution uh, through hybridization of two closely related species of shrews in Northern Alaska in response to really rapidly changing uh, climate up there. Also, increasingly, these collections are important for education and instilling the values of these collections in the younger age groups so that they're um, understanding uh, the importance of global biodiversity from an earlier age. Uh, and then, of course, the parasites, which may be themselves pathogenic or may be vectors of different kinds of pathogens. Uh, so this is a really integrated um, system of analyzing biodiversity that's not just my own, but uh, is extended beyond that. And so I just did just get a grant from NSF to start up another collection. By the way, the museum collection here is really fantastic. I had a great time looking through it today. I am kind of building my own collection at Kansas State. Um, and I kind of go under the principles of FAIR. So the FAIR principles are kind of the golden standard for ecological data management. I have adopted these for museum science um, because I think they really epitomize, or museum specimens really epitomize this, these principles. For instance, the specimens that are in the collection at Kansas State are now being digitized and published in online decentralized databases so that the globe can basically search for the specimens that they need uh, for their science. So they are entirely findable in uh, Arctos, for instance, or iDigBio and other publicly searchable databases. Um, they're entirely accessible because people from anywhere can ask for any of these different parts on loan, um, which can then be used for their science. They're interoperable because the same specimen can be used for a hundred or a thousand different kinds of questions. Uh, and they're reusable because they will outlast any of us and people can go back over and over again to take the same specimen and either repeat the same question to see whether or not it remains uh, true or was done right in the first place or to ask any other kinds of questions. So this is kind of the mentality that I have for modern museum collections. Uh, we currently only have about 2000 mammal specimens, so it's small, but it's growing. Um, and I've hired some personnel. This is my collections manager here, who is a recent graduate from K-State and who's very excited about collections. But this is the big part of it, is the various linkages that we can develop in this day and age to enhance these collections, particularly with the biomedical and the veterinary uh, science. And so um, ecologists who don't generally deal with specimens um, are very much involved with the development of this through the CONSA LTER site. Um, I've got a memorandum of understanding with K-State Vet Med to pull in specimens that otherwise would literally be thrown away. Um, the same with the state of Kansas, uh, the same with industries such as wind farms, and the same with academics who um, in the biomedical industry, for instance, handle wildlife potentially a lot, but really don't know what to do with it afterwards. And so this is kind of my MO for specimens. All right. So I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit more about uh, what I do within evolutionary ecology. Essentially, I work, oh, I didn't know that would change. I work with phylogenetics. 
I work with phylogeography and then comparative phylogeography. And I'm gonna go through each one of these with kind of an example from my research group and then finish up talking a little bit more about the potential for looking at this and what I'm doing towards those goals into the, into the future. So phylogenetics really is looking at the relationships amongst species or amongst families or genera or higher level taxonomy. Phylogeography is looking at diversification within a species or within closely related species. And then comparative phylogeography is really looking at regional responses of whole communities to the same environmental pressures uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. So my phylogenetics example is actually kind of timely. Excuse me. This publication just came out less than a month ago. Um, and it's on the northern bog lemming, which is now known as Mctomys borealis, but used to be Synaptomys borealis. So there was a big change in the taxonomy as a consequence of this work. Um, the northern bog lemming is a really interesting species, partly because we actually don't know virtually anything about this species, its ecology, its evolutionary history, its relationships to other species and so on and so forth. And yet it's also currently being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So they were interested, came to me to ask to do basically an evolutionary assessment of this species. We did population genomics as well as phylogenetics. I'm just focusing on the phylogenetics and in this case, basically what we did was we took the few samples of this species that we have um, and then added other samples from other taxa that are lemmings, so true lemmings, um, the presumed sister species, the southern bog lemming, Synaptomys borealis, and then uh, heather voles and various other different lemming groups. And then we build phylogenetic trees and look at the relationships across multiple differently inherited sets of loci, essentially. So this is nuclear, into, including thousands of individual single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then this is mitochondrial DNA. And essentially, um, what you can see here is that Mctomys borealis, the northern bog lemming, which was presumed to be sister to the southern bog lemming, is actually in its own very well-supported clade here. Um, through both mitochondrial DNA and also through thousands of nuclear SNPs. Um, and it's not actually very closely related to any of the other species. Um, the divergence of this taxon with, by, based on this mutation rate is in the region of two to two and a half million years. Sorry, at the back. Um, and that's a really deep divergence. Um, that's at the level of all of these different genera of different rodents. Uh, not only that, but it's not really very closely related to its presumed sister species at all. Um, and so really we had to basically rearrange the taxonomy of this species. How can you make decisions about listing species under the Endangered Species Act if you know virtually nothing about them? So essentially now we do. Uh, this was actually uh, primarily, primarily done the work of an undergraduate in my lab, Caitlin Headley, who did most of the mitochondrial sequencing for it anyway. The nuclear analyses were done by an old graduate student of mine, uh, Ben Weems. All right, so for phylogeography, the example I'm gonna use here is another graduate student's research of mine. This is Tommy Galfano, who's now up in uh, Western Ontario University looking at bighorn sheep genomics. Um, this research was actually funded through the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, and it's on this tiny little critter here, the least shrew, Cryptotus parvus. This is one of the smallest mammals in the world. It has a distribution shown by the shaded area here, very generally. Um, but the interesting thing is, well, why is New Mexico Game and Fish interested in this species, which is essentially an Eastern uh, US species? The reason being because in the last 10 years or 15 years or so, all of these locality records of specimens were collected from Eastern New Mexico. Um, and they wanted to know whether or not this was a single evolutionary unit or multiple ones. And they wanted to know whether or not this species is progressively expanding westward or whether it's always been there. Essentially, how do we manage this taxon uh, for the, on a state-by-state -state basis? So this was the focus, but we did a range-wide phylogeographic assessment and kind of jumping a uh, cart before the horse here. Phylogeographic assessments are looking for regional differentiation. And so um, there's these regions within the range that you can see are colored differently, represent independently evolving evolutionary lineages. Um, but back to the focal area in the Western range here, 
uh, essentially what we did was the same as with the bog lemmings. Um, we collected a bunch of specimens from throughout the range of least trues that you saw on the map on the last slide. And we built a phylogeny based on, again, thousands of nuclear loci um, to look at the evolutionary relationships. And what we can see is one primary well-supported clade here. Um, and then we have within it a very well, highly um, supported uh, lineage associated with one tiny little place in southeastern New Mexico. All these samples here with bars next to them are the samples from northern New Mexico. And so you can see that they're divergent from one another. Um, and this is a highly distinct lineage, but because they're not reciprocally monophyletic, we would say that they're within the same species. So it's intraspecific uh, lineages within there. Then we actually took these uh, genetic loci and we searched for loci that showed signals of selection. And these are um, non-neutral loci. And if, you if you're basically using loci that show signals of selection, you're looking for local, adapt local ecological adaptation, essentially. And this population in Southern New Mexico was distinct based on the non-neutral loci. We also have the neutral loci, and those would be considered, if it's divergent from neutral loci, you could consider them demographically independent. So worthy of independent management consideration. And again, this group is way off on its own. So this is essentially really important information for the state of New Mexico because we, they know that they have demographically independent, evolutionarily divergent and locally adapted um, set of populations down at this one place. And so, you know, you look at this place and it's a cool little area. I used to go down and work in this area a whole bunch. This is Bitter Lake National Wildlife Refuge around Roswell, New Mexico. And it's this tiny little area of pools surrounded by basically the Chihuahuan Desert. All right. So it's a highly isolated relictual cienega, which is an ancient wetland that's been there for a long, long time. And so from a comparative phylogeographic perspective, you start to look at other species here. And they're also highly distinct. And so the snails, for instance, the fish, the plants are all show signals of endemism here. And now we have a mammalian species. And so this is in itself a really important uh, little area for management, intensive management into the future, particularly considering it's extremely overgrazed and is shrinking by the year. So, all right, for comparative phylogeography, I'm gonna take an example from the most recent graduate student to head on his own path. Uh, Tommy Herrera is now at the Museum of Vertebrate, Biology, Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley, um, look at, looking at the evolution of deer mice. But for his master's thesis, he basically did a comparative phylogeographic assessment of mammals through the Great Plains. And this is where all of these specimens from the areas that we sampled kind of come into play, or it's one region. Um, we're gonna be using them into future years for lots of different questions. Um, but Tommy was interested in suture zones because essentially here in the Great Plains, you have the Great Plains grasslands in the center and the eastern forests in the east, and they come together at this suture um, basically um, throughout the middle of the country. And I'm interested in the interactions between communities associated with grasslands and communities associated with woodlands um, and what that might mean for, for instance, spread of disease or hybridization or other things. And so suture zones are these areas of secondary contact. That's how they were originally uh, described, uh, an interaction between discrete communities that have uh, experienced isolation and then reconnection and then interaction. Okay, so uh, this is the Great Plains suture zone and there's a number of suture zones described for North America um, particularly by Remington back in the late 60s. And he described the Texas suture zone as this area here based on the fact that he observed that there was a lot of hybridizing um, pairs of taxa from groups such as arthropods and birds and plants all through this region. So this is important from an evolutionary perspective for some reason. Um, and so again, this is basically looking at what are the dynamics of diversification through this region? What are the dynamics uh, through time for biodiversity? And we hypothesize that this is also an important evolutionary area for mammals. And so of course, um, when you're talking about evolution within species, 
uh, from a phylogeographic standpoint anyway, you're normally talking about relatively shallow time frames, but still really deep from an ecological perspective. And so I basically work, my thought process is back through the Quaternary period, which is roughly the last 3 million years of diversification. It's basically the time frame of most of the extant species on the globe. So it is really important for understanding global biodiversity that lives right now. But each of these glacial cycles basically cycled from warm interglacials like we're in right now to cold glacial periods, warm, cold, back through time. And the periodicity is relatively regular roughly every 100,000 years or so. And so this is the last glacial period. And you can see that there's lots of variability within each major glacial cycle. Um, but not too long ago, North, North America probably looked a lot more like this. Um, where you have ice built up over the continental land masses and lowered um, sea levels. And so again, you have this land bridge here, but every, all of the biodiversity basically over pretty much the entire country of Canada was either completely wiped out or shunted um, to the peripheries multiple times through the quaternary period. And so this is a time where biodiversity was basically being moved around like crazy. And that obviously has a lot of implications for evolutionary outcomes. We can almost consider this down here as a concentration of biodiversity during these periods. Uh, and then a kind of dilution of biodiversity as it moves back out again as the ice melts. So it's these kinds of dynamics for more of a diagrammatic representation where again, you could have say Western grassland species, Eastern woodland species coming together through the Great Prain plains at their periphery, and then periodically they're shunted south and away from each other and come back together again. That's kind of the working hypothesis. You'll also note, probably many of you are familiar with this concept of the 100th meridian and uh, both the uh, geological, geographic, and biological importance of this transition zone. This is Powell's transition between the arid west and the wetter east of North America. And so this region here, which basically just straddles exactly where we are right now, either my home here or your home here, um, has re really been kind of an, a growing, a growing importance as a focus for biological um, significance. Uh, and as I go through the rest of this talk, just kind of keep this transition zone in mind because it's uh, relevant. And so the methods that Tommy did was he chose a whole bunch of small mammal species, some associated with Western grasslands, some associated with Eastern woodlands, and then three species which are um, pretty much endemic to the Great Plains. And then uh, he chose these species based on previously recognized groupings of communities that are associated with these regional areas of North America. And then he developed ecological niche models to look at the presumed distribution of these species at the present time, and then project those into past time frames to look at change through time. And then he performed phylogeographic analyses on all of these. It was an enormous amount of work. It wasn't genomically deep. It was only using a single gene, but it was over lots of different species. So still an amazing amount of work. If you're not familiar with niche modeling, basically what you do is you take a species, you look for all of the specimens that exist within museum collections that are geo-referenced. Um, you take those latitudes and longitudes and for each of those points, um, you basically retrieve a bunch of climate data, mostly in the form of precipitation and temperature, or various different combinations of those. And from that, you basically project presumed um, tolerable niche for those species, and then you can see whether or not the projected niche is similar or overlapping with the realized niche, and if it's not, why not? But then you can also take these um, projections and um, you can then project them either into future time frames to make predictive hypotheses about changes in biodiversity into the near future, or you can project them into the past. So he projected them to the last glacial maximum. So this species with an Eastern distribution now, um, hypothetically was shunted South to this kind of distribution just about 20,000 years ago. And this is, presumably was a repeated process through the quaternary, but it also elicited lots and lots of evolutionary change. 
And so from a phylogeographic perspective to examine that evolutionary change for each species, you then take samples distributed from where you basically go out to the field and collect them and then sequence one or more genes and then build a phylogeny and look for well-supported lineages within that taxon. So here we have the Eastern wood rat. This is its distribution. Um, this is the phylogeny based on one gene. And you can see there's two very well-supported lineages, one green, and one blue. And if you plot those on a map, then this is the presumed distribution of those lineages with an equidistant separation line in there like that. So this is basically what he did for all four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 species that he was working with, um, and then looked at them in a comparative approach. So uh, these are the three Western species. I'm not gonna focus on the actual uh, species themselves. You may recognize some of these species. Most of the species he worked with occur right here in Nebraska too, not all of them. But these are the three Western species, and these are the distributional ranges of these three species. And the area where all three species overlap is pretty much west of the 100th meridian right here. Um, then you have the four Eastern species. And if you overlay their present distributions, this is the core area where all four of those species overlap, and it's east of the 100th meridian. So clearly, these are um, communities from different parts of North America. Um, and then you have the central species here, and they overlap right where we are, all right? Right straddling the 100th meridian. So those are the present distributions. And you put all that together, overlay those or stack those ecological niche models, and what you get is kind of a heat map for biodiversity for these small mammals. And the strongest number of species or the most number of species occurrence is right here in Kansas and Nebraska and Oklahoma. Um, but this is a little bit misleading from uh, what does this all mean? Because it kind of looks like this is a hot spot for biodiversity, but I would actually say this is kind of a melting pot um, for lots of species occurring in the same place on the peripheries of their range, not the shared core of their distribution. And so they're all kind of coming in contact, but most of their range is out here, or out here. Um, so it's kind of interesting to look at it in that perspective. Uh, if we then look at his hindcast niche models, and so here are the current ranges of the Western species back here, sorry, I'm probably in the way. Back here are the Western species um, projected to the last glacial maximum, and the core of their overlapping distribution has shifted over to Southern Texas and Northern Me Mexico. You then look at the Eastern fauna, and they have all shunted South, but the main core area for all four of these species is again here in Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. Um, there are other, other regions, but this actually shows how phylogeographic structure can form if you have multiple different refugial areas um, that then uh, uh, different populations diverge to. And then you have the central species where again, the main area of overlap for all of these was right down here in Southern Texas. And so basically instead of being shunted and separated, they're actually all being shunted and kind of condensed or um, pushed into the same kind of place. And so you look at this uh, together and now we basically have all of these species coming together right here where we are. Back then they were all coming together right here in the South and they basically are just shifting north and south. And so this zone of interaction between these discrete communities is staying the same, it's just moving north and south through time. And so this is kind of an important area from the perspective of um, discrete communities coming together. If we then look at the genetic results, obviously there's a lot here. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but essentially what you need to see is that all of these species have intraspecific um, diversification. There's two or three or sometimes four different lineages and the breaks between these lineages not so much for the Western species, but wait till you see the others. The breaks tend to align again with this region around Texas in here, more or less. This one was kind of an outlier. Um, if you look at the Eastern species, all, all four of these species have a really significant break between East and West that more or less lines up with the Mississippi River. And likely the Mississippi is a really important barrier to dispersal that has caused diversification. Um, but you do have the limits of all of these species, again, coming here right in Texas, basically, or between lineages. 
And then for the other three, the central species, you have a population for each that's associated with Southern Texas here, and then population in each, which is up here um, in the central Great Plains. So again, it seems to be like there's diversification through this region here. So how do you kind of summarize that? It's not easy to do um, from a statistical standpoint, but we can actually just spatially overlay um, the limits of species or the areas where different um, lineages are crossing or diverging from one another or, or experiencing secondary contact. And these are all the Western species and then overlay the Eastern species and then the central species. And what you can see is this zone right in here is where all of the action is happening basically for all of these mammals, whether they're from Western North America or Eastern North America. Uh, and so it's interesting to consider what is going on there. It certainly does seem to support this concept of the central Texas suture zone that Remington first described, uh, adding another group um, to the evidence for this particular region being an important center of evolutionary complexity. Um, what we found, which is perhaps the most interesting, is that it tends to be that the lineage that now occurs here where we are in the central Great Plains was also the same lineage that was shunted south to Texas. And so this is a Western species where this lineage was probably the same one down here. And this is an Eastern species where this lineage which is currently interacting with this one is the same lineage interacting with this one down here. And so you have these long-term interactions with units below the level of species through time that remain the same. And conversely, this lineage here and this one maybe have never experienced each other ever throughout the history of their evolution. And so Species as units of analyses, which are normally the focus of ecological studies, are not necessarily the best units of analyses for getting at which, um, in, which individuals or populations are actually interacting with one another um, on a molecular level. So you might ask, well, why does this matter? Um, and that's where I'm going to basically wrap this talk up. Um, is in my ongoing developing research. You've probably all seen some kind of a diagram like this before in the past. This is essentially showing global biodiversity decline. This isn't loss of species. This isn't extinctions. This is just loss of abundance within species. And what you can see is all of these red areas in the globe are areas of critical loss of abundance of biodiversity. And these are normally coincident with the grasslands and the arid lands of the globe. And surely the Great Plains is no exception. In fact, it's one of the most fragmented uh, regions of the entire world. Um, and so when you get environmental perturbation through various different forms of disturbance, whether it's cessation of fire or whether it's um, conversion of habitats into something else, then you get ecosystem perturbation. And these changes in ecosystems cause changes in the associated biodiversity. So you can get changing competitive interactions between species, which can lead to losses of biodiversity. You can get interactions between species that lead to the formation of new diversity. Um, you can get movement of associated biodiversity, such as swapping of parasites between host species, which can have implications for wildlife. And if your parasites can evolve fast enough, then movement into new species also elicits changes in the pathogen and pathogenicity, which of course can then lead to um, changes in our own human well being um, on various different levels. So, this is essentially what I do. Um, and this is a, one of the major areas where we can actually look at biodiversity and inform uh, human health uh, concerns. Um, so you look at predictions for new uh, mammal zoonoses interactions. I was not a part of this work. This is Hanadal in 2016. I wish I was. It's a really interesting paper. What it shows is number of new predicted reservoir species, and these are mammalian reservoir species, small mammals in particular, of zoonotic disease into the near future. I'm talking like within the next few decades. And these aren't new species of mammals to this area. These are new associations between existing mammals and new pathogens. 
And so this is really interesting that once again, they're centered right over this region of interaction between all of these small mammal species. And so we're actually seeing this come to pass and to a certain extent where we're seeing a lot, a big uptick in tick-borne, no pun, sorry, in tick-borne illnesses, which are increasing um, throughout this region, Lyme's disease and so on and so forth. Um, we are seeing decadal shifts in the dominant mammal species as we see, for instance, woody and progressive woody encroachment, you get a change from grassland small mammals to woodland small mammals and a change with all of the associated biodiversity. The problem is that we actually don't know very much about the associated biodiversity of wild mammal species. We don't know what the many, most of the parasites still are even, what species they are, um, what are the relationships between parasites and pathogens if they're vectors of disease, for instance. And so this is where these surveys are really coming into their own is that they're producing materials from which collaborative research can begin to resolve these kinds of relationships. So, um, this is an undergrad student who worked in my lab for four years. She's now down at OU working in the museum in Oklahoma. Um, and she uh, spent much of her time compiling tick information from the Kanza Long-Term Ecological Research Station. Um, this is Kanza Prairie Biological Station. These are all of my study areas here, um, the ones that are colored anyway. And she basically compiled abundance of ticks and host associations of ticks. And what you can very clearly see is that tick abundance is not evenly distributed across this experimental landscape. The darker colors mean there's much, much higher densities of ticks. And these, of course, are the woody habitats. And so they've stopped burning in these areas. They become woody encroached. And with that, you get a change in the dominant small mammal species from the grassland associated deer mouse to the woodland associated white footed mouse. And you also get a re really significant increase in the abundance of ticks that are associated with these small mammal species. And so all of a sudden you've introduced a whole new set of associations between ticks, tick-borne pathogens, the small mammals themselves, and at the same time seeing declines in uh, the native prairie biodiversity. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic where we're trying to, I'm seeking funding right now in collaboration with vet med folks to basically set up long-term surveillance for um, the evolution of vector-borne pathogens on Kanza Prairie, which is predominantly an ecological research site. In addition to that, I did manage to get funding from the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, and I'm also doing this work in collaboration with some of the folks here um, at UNL um, to look at the genetics and genomics of uh, both mule deer and white-tailed deer through the state of Kansas. This is a really big deal for the state of Kansas um, because th these two deer species are basically the source, uh, the highest source of revenue coming into the state of pretty much anything. So they're hugely economically important. Um, they're also seeing a precipitous decline in mule deer, particularly through Western Kansas. So here, the dark dots represent the distribution of mule deer. The white dots represent the distribution of white-tailed deer, which are basically throughout the state. And so both species co-occur in this part of the state. Um, so what's interesting is that we're also experiencing increasing incidence of chronic wasting disease. Um, and what we're looking at now is very preliminary data, but essentially this map here shows the genomic landscape for white-tailed deer. And it should be obvious to pretty much any of you out there um, that the white-tailed deer in this part of the state are genomically different predominantly than the white-tailed deer in this part of the state. What's interesting is that we also have genetic data for mitochondrial DNA for the prion protein gene for susceptibility to chronic waste and disease and thousands of nuclear SNP loci. And the species assignment based on those different genetic data sets is sometimes discordant. And all of the discordance that we see is also in this region of the state. All of these pink dots are basically discordance between different genetic data sets, which are associated with this kind of genomic legacy with white-tailed deer. And interestingly, this is also where pretty much all of the incidents of chronic wasting disease in the state of Kansas is. So one hypothesis, and I stress it's simply a hypothesis, is that you know, some kind of hybridization event at some point in the past between mule and white-tailed deer may have some kind of impact on 
what we know of their evolutionary history and also what may be relative susceptibility to disease. And so hybridization you know, is thought to impact fitness in one way or another. Um, it's intriguing, intriguing to think that this might be happening in deer within Kansas. So I'm also carrying on with phylogeographic studies, just adding more species to the equation because there's so many other mammals out there. And so this is new work funded through the Kansas Department of uh, Wildlife and Parks to work on Southern flying squirrels. And that's a hot topic here at Lincoln, as I understand it. Um, and it is also of importance in Kansas because this is a species that's thought to only occur right on the border with Missouri. Um, but a new graduate student of mine, Brandon Bernhard, is out setting camera traps all over the place. And everywhere he's looking in eastern Kansas, he's finding, finding flying squirrels. So they're much more abundant than they used to be. So again, this is informing the state agencies. And we're doing genetics and genomic assessments on these two. So just to finish up real quick, um, what I would say is that from one health perspectives, understanding the biodiversity responses and the ecosystem responses to global change through time can be really informative. And then um, using that to look at human health afterwards. I hope I've convinced you that we can use these various techniques to, as a predictive framework for looking for biodiversity hotspots by combining evidence from ecology and evolution. And I would also argue very strongly that species as units of analyses are often, perhaps very often, not the best unit of focus. And intraspecific biodiversity is more important in some respects. And I would also just say that our region right here through the Central Great Plains is not just a flyover region. Um, this is a really important region for um, biodiversity sciences into the future. So, um, I'll just finish there. I, there's lots and lots of folks involved with this. Again, my, my research is highly collaborative and, and the most numerous um, contingent of collaborators that I have are the students, um, particularly undergraduate students, but also graduate students. And so, um, you know, um, big teams of people doing all the work. Uh, these are kind of my funding sources for the most part. And these are the collaborative sources over here. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Looks like I got a couple minutes. Any up or down, if I'm understanding right. Um, how do you predict that the future land use will change the dynamic of that suture zone and then will it like unsuture it? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, a, that's actually a really, it's an insightful question because essentially what we're seeing is massive fragmentation. Um, and so uh, we're getting interactions that are um, different on a much finer scale um, because if you have fragmentation, then you have isolation. And so you have um, demographic independence. And so any kind of interaction that you have is essentially, well, one, much more complicated. Also likely not necessarily following these predictions that you have based on abiotic variables such as climate. And so actually, yeah. So the next step there is we have a framework, we have a hypothesis essentially. How can we use developing emerging technologies such as land proofing, land cover layers of, of agriculture versus um, woody encroachment versus uh, barriers such as interstate highways or waterways and put those into the equation. I mean, I don't have a, an answer, but, but it's like we actually are beginning to develop the tool set across disciplines to, to be able to ask those questions tangibly. Yeah, it's, it's an insightful thought process because um, there's so many different things happening right now. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation. I'm Shabani Mola. I'm a PhD student uh, in, in ecology. I worked also on one health project uh, in Tanzania, it's uh, in part of Africa. And I'm very impressed with the work that you've done. I wanted to know um, the major parasite that circulates in the shoe that you collected 
in Kansas City. And I just want to know, so is there any spillover from those children to the environment or to other animals, even to human being? Because you talked about somatic diseases in the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's another interesting question. Um, the parasites that are in shoes are hyper diverse. One of the issues is we don't even know what they are yet, but we do have a handle on the major genera. What's interesting about shrew endoparasites is that most of them are fairly specific to shrews themselves, but shrews are a very, very diverse group. Um, you know, there's hundreds of different species of shrews, um, and those different groups of parasites are variably co diverged. Some are literally one host, one parasite, others are just really closely related species per parasite, and then other parasites are generalist across. So, so in terms of them infecting and impacting other highly divergent components of biodiversity, I would say that they're not really at risk of that, but it makes them kind of an interesting group because they're low risk and because they have variable levels of host specificity across um, hundreds of different kinds of parasites. And so it's a surrogate for the dynamics of host swapping versus co-evolution um, that we can use to understand, you know, some of the more serious issues that we're dealing with in terms of parasitology. It's kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. But I, as far as I know, most of those parasites are not associated with humans, for instance. There are some shrew parasites that can be, but, but most of the endoparasites are not. So like the ectoparasites, the fleas and the ticks potentially, so. Well, it's right on half past, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Should I stop recording? Hmm.